Uli, finally, it's up to you. And ladies and gentlemen, here on the, on the right side, I count on you putting a question. Thanks. Uli Schof, Bertelsmann Stiftung. Actually, I would like to come back to what you said. I mean, probably most of the people in the room, you know, agree uh, saying that the EU Commission has, has screwed up the narrative and we, we have to fix the narrative. And so really coming back to this question, how do we fix the narrative? Because even if they tell right now there's no race to the bottom, it's just upwards and nobody believes in it. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to fix it like this. And I would just combine it, this question with, um, with, the, with another one, which is you, you call it, you know, don't call it tra tra trade agreement, just call it differently, frame it differently. Say, for example, regulatory cooperation. This is what we, what we are talking about here. And, and, and for me, it's not so clear how do you approach this kind of regulatory cooperation process, so not trade agreements, but a regulatory cooperation process in the context of TTIP, but also in the, in the, in the multilateral context. How do you really design this uh, and approach this um, uh, so that you get the narrative right? Because I just to take this example of TTIP, I think one big issue in the TTIP discussion here in Germany is ISDS and, and, and investor state dispute settlement. And I think probably one of the next things that could be the critical issue in TTIP here in Germany could be uh, uh, the, the aspect of regulatory cooperation. So how, how the regular cooperation is designed in the future because people are, say, are saying, if you don't do the race to the bottom thing right now in the, in the agreement, you will do it in your institutional regulatory cooperation things in the future. So there is rather the question, how do you design this kind of process on the one hand in this kind of uh, TTIP agreement, or how do you design it multilateral? And, and Pascal Ami was already saying, you know, there is some kind of monitoring role for the WTO. How do you really approach it step by step? How do you make it more transparent that the narrative is right? So, long story. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, could you just hand on the, uh, over the microphone? But the lady is first, and then you. Uh, the lady is first here. Thank you. I'm Heike Löschmann with the Handlich Bauer Foundation in Berlin, and uh, the previous speaker has already addressed uh, a, a part that hasn't really been discussed here. And I think that's the second reason why so many people have been out on the street. It's not only uh, that uh, Germans are probably the, the champions of precautionary principles, but I think uh, Petra Pinsler mentioned there is an inherent democracy issue in it, and that's related to ISDS. Uh, People simply do not want to see um, a parallel uh, uh, juri uh, jurisdiction or what do you say, like ju jurisdiction. Um, people do not want to see a potential policy space of the state to be decreasing because we are bound to um, a trade agreement. And I want to draw a parallel to the so-called developing world. I have myself worked many years in Southeast Asia, where, by the way, I have witnessed a lot of street protests in Thailand, for example, um, in the old world against AOA and also access to medicine issues, intellectual property rights. But I want to draw the attention to how the uh, investment agreement of Burma, Myanmar, a very new uh, comer in the, in the world of trade and investment, um, has been very initially shaped, and that had somehow the logic of an inbuilt ISDS in it. And um, there were, hope, uh, there were uh, luckily, some critical minds who have actually really tried to tr tr troubleshoot with the Burmese government to raise awareness of what they give away as a young um, nation joining international trade policy. Um, when it comes to regulating their own multi-ethnic policy space, that's like troubleshooting number one um, when, when, you, when you open up your markets. And I think there is some sort of logic in here that is not only related to how we actually try to sort of give investors priority rights, but it is also seen in the context of a um, new member of the international trade system that's really not really fit to, to even understand fully the implications of it. And I think there is some uh, unfair uh, principle at work that has to be addressed. So I go beyond the immediate democracy question here in, in Germany or Europe. There is, there is something to it in a different part of the world as well. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the intervention and question, and the gentleman with his statement or question. Uh, yeah, Zhao Zhao Changhui, China Action Bank. Uh, the question is actually uh, uh, to be addressed by the panel and uh, possibly uh, uh, to Mr. Lamy in particular. Now, uh, with the newly established regionalism under the uh, um, TPP, um, is this really something that reactionary to the status quo under the rules of WTO regime? If it is a yes, how far is it really uh, you know, pushing backward uh, to uh, the um, uh, multilateralism? Um, if, however, uh, you think the um, TTP is something trendy, uh, then, uh, then how much uh, you really think that uh, agreement push forward to uh, the international trade regime that will be in place in the future? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to open up uh, who wants to take what. Um, Joe. Uh, okay, jump in for a minute on ISDS. And the US, TTIP would not be the first case of negotiating an investment agreement, right? And we have investor state dispute provisions around now. It's not working. Um, that doesn't mean we can't fix it. I mean, there's a proposal by the EU to essentially move this into a formal court structure for a dispute process where you have professional arbitrators. Whereas at the moment, this, to some extent, this web of treaties is be, being used to extract rents from governments. You have the Swedes suing Germany for phasing out nuclear power. You have the French suing Egypt for implementing a minimum wage. You have tobacco companies suing Australia because they put in health provisions on tobacco. That's not what was intended with these. But so that doesn't mean that we have to do that in future. And, and the, the, you know, the commission has put forward an idea to actually professionalize the system, create something like the dispute settlement body so that you take out this sort of behind the room rent extraction process, which is basically very lawyer intensive and has made a lot of people a lot of money, but is not what the system was meant to be about. So I think there's a positive way to even spin that, which is we can fix this. Go ahead. On, the, on the regulatory cooperation question, how, how do you go about doing this? And I think there is, to my mind, really an open question as to what is the value of embedding these things in trade agreements, right? So in a sense, that's taken as given, right? We've gone down that track, but with very little in the way of, I think, actually having thought about how, what is the mechanism design? How, what are the institutional dimensions? That, that was the question that was raised. How do you actually do this and how do you make the trade agreement actually be on net beneficial in terms of achieving these regulatory objectives, achieving the cooperation, et cetera? And I think there is a whole set of uh, questions there which have not really been explored anywhere near enough in depth, with, which relates to the issue of how do you bring in participation? How do you do a, an effective consultation process? I think the consultation process the Commission does today is a farce, right? It, you basically have a lot of people coming into the room and they say what they think, but it's completely, you know, there's no d deliberation there really at all, as far as I can tell, in terms of trying to get to figure out what are the issues and how do we actually deal with them and what is the agenda therefore we should pursue, which might not involve negotiation at all. Like, I mean, as has been said repeatedly, it's not really a negotiation issue per se. And that has to involve the regulators, right? So where are the regulators in this process? So if we're talking about democracy and a democratic deficit and accountability, in a sense, we have already written down rules and laws for our regulatory institutions to do a job, right? So that's, that's in a sense there. So I think it's really more a question, how do you give those regulators a mandate to do more to cooperate with each other to achieve their objectives? And I think that institutional Mecha it's really a mechanism design type question, which I think we need an answer to. Now, I've been trying, I've been doing work in this particular area over the last year or two, and one of the things I found, it is very difficult to get traction as to mobilizing funding for this, getting people to buy in, because it has to be interdisciplinary. So if you go and talk to ec economists, they have a very rigid view of how this gets done. What we really need, we need economists, sociologists, political scientists. This is really, this is kind of made to measure for multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary work, and that's very difficult uh, to get off the ground. So, 
if I'm allowed to give a pitch for research and the, to the foundations in this room, I think this is really something to focus on. I mean, it's because it really will have uh, it, an, an operational impact in terms of the commission is looking for this. USTR is looking for this. So it's not that they're resistant uh, to this. So I think that would be one, um, one point I would, um, I would make. On, on the policy space, just very quickly. I think here the issue is really more about process as opposed to substance. Right? And I think what we, knew, what we need to do, and I think where the trade agreements can actually help, is put in place an institutional infrastructure where you actually do the right type of process. To say, okay, why do we need this policy space? What are our objectives? What are our instruments? That, I think, is where it can help. Uh, not about, thou shalt not do this. Right? So I think that's the wrong way of, uh, of writing down these agreements. And I, I agree with you, there are, there are some of these countries who essentially get the wrong type of advice, sign agreements, they have no idea what they're signing for, and I think that's really, uh, that is obviously uh, bad, bad news. Very quickly, did I cut you short just a moment ago? Um, Pascal, would you mind, uh, and Petra, um, the uh, question that the lady was asking, from free trade um, to fair trade, um, with the example of Myanmar, um, and sort of you know, going one step beyond uh, the democ democracy question. Would you care to pick that up? don't know who wants to I mean, go first. Fine. Uh, I mean, f first, so on semantics, you are absolutely right. Calling a precaution convergence process a trade negotiation is a huge mistake because it gives the impression that you are negotiating precaution. And if there is something I don't want <laughs> to negotiate is my desired level of precaution. I can agree to discuss this, I can agree to make it more user-friendly, but I'm not ready to discuss the fact that this is negotiable because this is values. I mean, at least part of that is values. <coughs> on investor to state, there is a huge confusion on this issue, uh, stemming partially from what you said, which is sort of uh, some of these agreements being uh, mishandled. <laughs> The fundamental question is very simple. Uh, I'm a European investor in the US, or in Myanmar. I am putting money down there. Do I trust the US judiciary system to protect my interests? Do I trust the Burmese judicial system to protect my interests? Yes or no? If yes, you don't need any specific litigation channel. But Countries so far have answered no. In their vast majority, the Germany has ISDS provisions in all in bilateral investment agreements. So the, the answer so far, the market answer so far has been, I don't trust the judicial system of the country with whom I have an investment treaty. Now, this can be reversed. It needs a solid argument to reverse such a big majority of the market. And then there's another question of if you cannot reverse it and you stick with a bilateral litigation channel, how do you frame this so that the right to regulate is not hampered by corporates, by private interest, and which is fine with that. But you know, the, this, is, this, is the fundamental, uh, this is the fundamental question. On, uh, on fair trade, free trade, you know, that's, a, that's a philosophical question. Uh, the difference between, we know what free trade is. More, more exactly, we know what open trade is. What fair trade is, is trade open in a way that both partners to trade believe is fair. Because if I have a view of what is fair trade, and you have a view of what is fair trade, and we don't share the same view and we trade, we have a problem. So fair is relative, and the only proof that trade is fair is that both partners to trade agree that it is fair, which is why you have, you need trade negotiations <laughs> in the past. So you know, it's, it's something that, fair is something that is in my eye, but there is no guarantee that what I call fair, you will call fair and the other way around. So it's a philosophical problem. Finally, on your very important question of you know, what does this mean for WTO? TPP, as we said, includes provisions that have to do with labor standards, with environmental standards, 
and with anti-corruption standards. Vietnam, Malaysia, in Asia, Latin American countries participating to TPP, but they never were a problem in WTO with labor standards, environmental standards, or even anti-corruption. The big problems were India, and since China joined China. Now, Vietnam and Malaysia have accepted to link trade provisions with labor provisions, environmental provisions, and anti-corruption provisions. Because the US arm twisted them. And I mean, seen from a European point of view, I'm fine with that. I like this provision because I think trade opening has to do with labor standards, environmental standards, and anti-corruption. But that's, that's a political point of view. Now, the question is whether, other than Malaysia and Vietnam in Asia, notably India and China, will accept such links in WTO in the future. I'm not sure about that. And then you've got the next question, which is precaution, which is the futuristic one. And there, I think it is in the interest of India and China to make sure that WTO is given a mandate to monitor precaution harmonization, starting, by the way, with the area which Bernd was, was mentioning, which is services. Uh, having a horizontal TBT-like agreement on services would be a great step forward for the multilateral system and, in my view, for countries like China and India. I could listen to you all day. Um, it's just that we have a common enemy, which is called time, and uh, uh, all our time is almost eaten up. First of all, Petra, um, with your replique, um, and then a one-sentence last question to each and every one. Yeah, quick remark to ISDS, which leads back to the to the opening remark that I made. Look at the at the content of the of the treaties. When they are called free trade treaties, there are all kinds of things in there. And one of the reasons why people actually went out to the streets and demonstrated against TTIP is the ISDS question, um, because not just the, the the number of the ISDS cases is exploding because it becomes more and more a business case for for law for, for big law companies. Um, suing countries, we, we did a huge research with a couple of correspondents. We actually, we found risk funds who are actually funding a lawsuit against countries just as a business case, which I think is something that has to be changed. And the question with TTIP is, when this thing is put into TTIP, this thing will go around the world. So TTIP, in a, in a way, is the fight whether either we have ISDS or we have not ISDS. And I would actually say, if a country, if a company goes to a country which is high risk, why not? May Thank I finish you. the sentence? <laughs> um, yeah, yes. You were told you had one minute more at the beginning. You had five minutes, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> Was it five? Yeah, at least. Take, take seven. <laughs> Give me one. <laughs> It's not really fair. <laughs> okay, I, I cut it short because I know you all want to have your cup of coffee and we can maybe continue the conversation later on. I think ISDS is a real problem and one of the reasons why the Commission is actually um, trying to reform it is because people protested against it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have picked up the issue at all. So we need more and more people um, thinking about what's wrong and what's right with the trade issue and I'm happy that we have this debate and that these things are actually being picked up by not just economists but also by all kinds of, of other people and they are totally agree. We need more political involvement because free trade and trade is a political issue. Um, just to finish with the question of the story, I know how to write stories. Sometimes I write even good stories, but I can't write a good story if the content is flawed. And I think this is still an issue. If we really believe in Pascal's story, we have to make this story true. And I like his story, but I don't believe that the American side up to now thinks that TTIP is just about better regulation for everybody. And as a very really final sentence, if it was about better regulation, why wouldn't they talk in uh, Miami, Miami next week about um, the standards for air quality? Just look at the VW scandal. So, those are the issues they to, should talk, to, talk about to regain credibility. They should maybe think about Paris and the CO2 emission. They haven't touched those issues. So I think to make it a good story, you have to think about the content again. Very quickly, one sentence each. Next step that you personally, from your point of view, from your organization's <coughs> point of view, are going to do as regards um, trade agreements. Andreas. Well, um, I, at least I... I 
I learned that it would be important to continue research in a, in a, in a kind of multidisciplinary way. And I think we, we think about doing things like that. So we, so we, we keep on track. Um, I think uh, still we need to, to kind of clarify myths. Uh, one myth for me is still that you say if, if there is a winner, there has to be a loser. I don't think so. Um, I think it's, it's a matter of how it's done. Uh, I, I totally agree that, that it's not everything perfect in the way how, it's, how it looks like in the direction, but I think it can be done. And, I th and, and finally, I think it has to be done. I think we don't have, we, we're not in a situation to, to spare growth, um, even if it's not much, but it's, it's not a growth only here, it's also for other countries. If you do it properly, I think we have to dig that wherever we can find it. Um, and uh, we try still to kind of uh, put that, that additional amount of transparency where we can do it and uh, try our best.